Well, Tonsa Kiwao, uh, thank you guests and panelists. Farm to Can Can Cafeteria Canada welcomes you to a conversation with land-based learning and food system education. My name is Robbie Knott, my pronouns are he, him, and I'll be facilitating today's discussion. I'm a planner at Alder Hill, an indigenous owned and operated planning firm in BC. I'm a cis male Red River Métis, grateful to be joining you from the unceded ancestral and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations in what is now known as Vancouver, BC. A lot of liquid sunshine here this afternoon. I'm sure the plants are happy. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here today, joined with our special guests, Damon, Allen, and Cyan, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, we also have Farm to Cafeteria Canada's director, Jesse Veenster, with us, who will frame the context of this discussion on land-based learning. So go ahead, Jesse. Thanks so much, Robbie. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for being here today to talk about land-based learning. Uh, my name is Jessie Beenstra, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the director of Farm to Cafeteria Canada. Um, it's my honour to be joining you today, also from the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, otherwise known as Vancouver, BC. Uh, before we dive into today's conversation, I just wanted to take a moment to share a little bit about why Farm to Cafeteria Canada is hosting a conversation about land-based learning, and why we feel it's an important one to have. Uh, so we are a partnership-based organization with a vision for vibrant and sustainable regional food systems that support the health of people, place, and planet. We believe that it's essential for children and youth to have an opportunity to connect with their food and in doing so to think about where that food comes from. So we work toward our vision by providing support to school communities to engage students in eating, preparing, harvesting, growing, and embracing healthy and local food. This allows students to not only develop food literacy, but also to connect with the broader community and ultimately create stronger regional food systems around them. But this connection of children to their food inherently also extends to their connection to the land and the waters that that food comes from. And so we believe it's also essential for kids to have the opportunity to think and to learn about the land and their relationship with it to explore their responsibility to the land and to consider how their own lives and health are interconnected with it. Uh, we've also heard from our community of educators and partner organizations that there's really a deep interest to learn more about the concept of land-based learning and how to embrace it in teachings in a way that's appropriate but not appropriating. And lastly, I'll say that Farm to Cafeteria Canada, through our Nourishing Relations Initiative, we're really working to envision how our mandate and our operations can better honor, amplify, honor and amplify Indigenous voices, perspectives, values, and ways of knowing. And we acknowledge and celebrate that the potential that land-based learning has to support both our mandate and decolonizing practices. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that this is a learning journey and uh, while we may not have all the answers, we're definitely committed to holding space for the conversation so that we can all continue to grow and ultimately learn together. So we hope that you find today's conversation valuable and we hope that it's the first of more to come. Uh, and so with that, it's my pleasure to welcome you all and I just really want to extend my deepest gratitude to all of our guests today. Uh, Cyan, Damon, and Alan for sharing your time and your knowledge and your experiences with us, and also to Robbie for helping to guide us through the conversation. Uh, so Robbie, I'm going to pass it over to you, uh, and I'm going to sit back and listen quietly, um, but I am going to otherwise just disappear. Sounds good. Thanks, Jesse, and thanks to F2. CC for creating this space. It's, it is truly amazing. And I know I've definitely told a few folks about it already in the last couple of weeks since I've, since I've learned about it. So I'd like to introduce our panelists, starting with Damon Wittung. Damon's an educator with Black Duck Wild Rice and a mother of two with another one on the way in December. Damon's been raised learning, working, and loving wild rice, taught to her by her dad, James Wittung, who's the dreamer and founder of Black Duck Wild Rice. Damon believes that a connection to the land has been disrupted for many and hopes to help people reconnect back to the land and water through wild rice and her experience with it. Black Duck Wild Rice has been rehabilitating, protecting and promoting wild rice for over 39 years. And Damon's joining us from Peterborough. It's so nice to have you with us, Damon McGwitch, for being here. Wild rice makes me think of my, uh, my grandma in uh, Travers Bay. And we also have uh, Alan McDonald here with us. 
Alan teaches grades seven and eight in an enrichment program called Challenge North at Lower Borough Public School in Sydenham, Ontario. He's initiated and contributed to many of his school's recent projects, including a salad bar grant from Farm to School Canada, a school composting program, building raised garden beds on site, and supporting a large food bank garden within the community with the motives of increasing food literacy, addressing climate action, and finding opportunities for reconciliation. These initiatives have included the creation of a wampum-inspired artwork in collaboration with Indigenous community members and cultural spaces on school property. That's a lot of initiatives, Alan. <laughs> so nice of you <laughs> to be here today with us. And uh, we also have uh, Sion Nalawag with us, who is an educational assistant at Skad Gane Elementary School on Haida Gwaii. Cyan is a food champion, land protector, and passionate advocate for children's rights. Cyan is a member of the Early Childhood Educators of BC, the Canadian Child Care Federation, and vice president of the local Canadian Union of Public Employees. Family means everything to Cyan, and if not at work, you can find her on the beaches and in the forests with her family. It's really nice to have you here, Cyan. I love that article about the local farm to school program, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into in a second here. Each of you bring such a creative, amazing ways of knowing and approaches to your work, and I'm really looking forward to jumping into the questions. Um, we'll be asking you a series of questions, um, and I, uh, before we jump in, encourage each of the panelists to share their pronouns and acknowledge the territories that they're joining us from. And so we'll, uh, we'll flip the order here, and uh, we'll start with Cyan. Um, and wondering, yeah, if there's anything you'd like to add to your introduction or share some of the work you're, you're, you're working on. Mm -hmm. Hawa Ravi. Um, my name is Cyan Nalawag. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, with gratitude, um, I'm honored to share with you all from the unceded territory, traditional territory of the Haida people, where I live, gather food, work, and play. Um, I wish to honor my past as I'm gratefully indebted to, to the community that I belong to. Uh, addiction found me on the streets of my hometown of Port Alberni, BC, and at age 34, I hit rock bottom. I was malnourished, nourished, disconnected from my family and community and not belonging. During those days, my mother never gave up. And with the change of people, places and things, I received an intervention that saved my life. With my father living on Haida Gwaii for most of my life, it was natural for me to join him on my healing journey. I found community, I found the beach, I was nurtured and fed and from the land, and I witnessed ceremony. I educated myself, I sparked my joy for working with children, and I potlatched with chiefs and matriarchs. This is where it began. This is the medicine that I received, and this is why I have been giving back ever since. I'm a recent graduate uh, with Early Childhood Education, as Robbie spoke of, a Diverse Abilities Education Diploma. My philosophy follows the British Columbia Early Learning Framework. I value this framework as it is a living document that is a culmination of collaboration process that includes early childhood educators, primary teachers, academics, uh, Indigenous organizers, elders, government, and other professionals. As an educator, I have an opportunity for ongoing dialogue with colleagues, families, and the broader communities. This is where I found my best practice. Working as a pedagogy of listening, I heard from elders and other knowledge keepers that shared something that resonates with me and I feel these words may resonate with you all too. When we eat from the land, we are connected to our ancestors. I have worn many hats in my school district on Haida Gwaii. One position that stood out for me was my role as a South Island food coordinator. This experience formed my foundation as I fostered relationships with the precious children, their families and their colleagues and my colleagues. These secure attachments are strategies for fostering resiliency. As I took a temporary leave from the food coordinating position to complete my diploma, I found my passion in the classroom. I am currently employed as an educator assistant in the kindergarten grade one split class with an amazing educator. During the month of September, she webbed her land-based education with a field trip to the Trundle Creek to view the spawning salmon and explore the forests and trails that have been home to generations of Tawn, black bear in Haida, and the Haida people for many thousands of years. Hawa for hearing my voice. Hawa for sharing, Cyan. Thank you so much. It's, it's an honor to be here with you today and learning from you. Next, we have uh, Alan. Anything you'd like to share with your intro? Thanks so much, Cyan, for sharing uh, sharing your story. Um, 
I, uh, my name is Alan McDonald and uh, I, my pronouns are he, him. And uh, I'd like to say Anin Boju for the, some of the Anishinaabewein that I'm just starting to learn with the in language of the indigenous people of the area that I am, that sustains me, uh, which is the land of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. Um, the community that I'm in is, is known as Sydney, Ontario, just north of Kingston. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful space. I grew up in a, a space called Scarborough, Ontario, which is a suburb, kind of a sub-industrial suburb with some beautiful little spots in it, but uh, that, that of, of Toronto. And then when I moved out here, uh, here I landed at this school where you could swim in the lake and you could eat the fish uh, in that lake. And not so much so uh, <laughs> in Lake Ontario and parts. And so my gratitude for the last several years of the land uh, for me has, has been really, really deep. And um, the teaching moments that have been most meaningful, I hope, to for me and for my students are those that help us find gratitude, maybe gratitude or appreciation of privilege that we have, um, privilege to be in a place where the environment is clean, a responsibility to take care of that land. And I think at the heart, I, mean, I don't want to jump right to the ending of, of what I have to say, but really at the heart of the land-based learning that we do is we learn to grow food with my students and um, some of the initiatives that you were mentioning, Robbie. Uh, it, having a stewardship for the land that comes from appreciating what it does for us and having that, that sense of gratitude and, and an honorable harvest as we've learned about it as well. So Chi Miigwech for, for having me. Mm. Thank you so much, Alan. Yeah, it's a treat for you to be here. Definitely have gratitude for that. <laughs> and then last, but certainly not least, we have Damon. Ani, Damon and Dishnikaz, Curve Lake and Dunjaba. Um, My name is Damon. I'm from Curve Lake, Peterborough, Ontario area. Um, I'd like to say thank you to you guys for including me in this conversation. And Alan, for the work that you do, and Cien, for the honesty that you've given us already. Uh, I'm really excited and I'm really uh, grateful because one thing we all share in common is food and the more we can feed ourselves and our hearts and uh, the better we all we all will be right so thank you and thank you Robbie for uh, facilitating this and I go by the pronouns of her thank you Damon yeah so looking forward to jumping right in and you know, I, I just open up the next question to anyone who would like to start with it. And uh, what does land-based learning mean to you as an approach to education? When you take students outside, something changes in them, right? Some of your students who might be labeled behavioral, they, they settle down. And I, I remember being a, a student teacher and I was in Nunavut. I was in the community of Pangertung and um, they had... Uh, a spring camp activity. So there I was, you know, 26 years old, get in the back of a Kamotik, and we went out in the Cumberland Sound, and the land just opened up into the white landscape of frozen, frozen ocean and white sky. There was just complete openness, and I thought, no wonder these students don't enjoy being in these four walls when this is this is where they've been really raised by their elders, their families. And I took that back with me when I began teaching and I would take kids outside as often as possible because there really is something quite grounding about being outside, whether you're writing, doing a literacy lesson, or directly learning about the culture of the indigenous community of that land or learning to grow food. Um, so it's, it starts with the, just the, the natural effect in our relationship with the land. And the cool thing is the more I've learned about the Anishinaabe culture is it, it is all about one's relationship to the land. And what I'm discovering, and I think accurately, is um, reconciliation is a healing of our relationship with people as well as our relationship to the land. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead, Damon. Yeah, I'd like to join in there. Um... For me, land-based learning is about learning from the environment as well and just getting outside and the learning that comes that you can't get from a book or an internet or a Zoom. Like those things are great and part of the learning cycle, but um, it's a different kind of learning. Like we're not, I don't feel like we're the teachers, right? The 
friend is doing the teaching and we are just helping facilitate that. So like for me, a lot of like, I can't talk about land-based learning without talking about the disconnect that's happened. And so for me as an indigenous person, this has happened through colonization, um, through genocidal practices of our Canadian government. And, and it's the breaking of us from our food systems, from our elders, from our land, from our rights, from our resources, from, from um, breaking the connection to our children, right? And, and, and the breaking of the learning process that came with that. But also for everybody, all, all people have a disconnect to the, to the land through colonization, which is um, conquering nature, right? Which is, I think, like where a first big misstep happens for people is that we're, we can't conquer nature. We, we work better with nature or we get more from it when we work together instead of trying to tame it or um, we see ourselves as protecting ourselves by the buildings that we live in or we use pesticides to like maintain our lawns and things like that. We build dot dams to provide us with more and yet we don't realize what we're losing from that, right? So um, when I spend time in nature, I, I see it like I see the relationships between things and that's the learning that comes from, from uh, being outside and land-based learning, right? Is those making those connections and seeing them on a day-to-day, -day, on a day-to-day -day. and each day that I spend out there creates a fuller picture of my understanding of the world and myself within it, right? So, trying to learn where our food comes from in nature is about understanding nature and you can't understand it unless you're out there with it, right? So, land-based learning is, is a fuller experience that comes and something that has to be mended because of our disconnects to it. Thanks, Damon. You touched on so much there, my goodness, the, the strands of, you know, returning to land and nourishing it, but also not looking to dominate it. The synergies, like the, the mutual symbiosis that happens and that's all around us. I'd love to return on that. Um, Cyan, did you have anything to add or even your own tangent? <laughs> I sure do. Yeah, those <laughs> wonderful words that both of you spoke of. Um, for me, land-based um, learning, as I approach land-based learning with my best practice, I reflect on my experiences that I've had with changing results for young children. Uh, it's a British Columbia Ministry of Education Early Years Initiative, uh, one of the seven facets of the changing results for young children's social and emotional wellness is the sense of identity. Who am I? The sense of identity is important for all children with the key to that identity being resiliency. Uh, the impact of having a strong identity, not only in our early years, but throughout the lifespan, is instrumental in our ability to contribute as a caring citizen and stewards to the land and waters. My teachings foster secure attachments when working in the greenhouse. I work with, one on, with a one-on-one -on -one, um, student that really connects to the land when, when watering in the greenhouse. Um, this approach opens her mind, builds character, connects um, her to her school community and the broader community and nurtures the unique qualities that every child has. A very important part of my job is building caring relationships with children as I'm a role model and practice what I teach. I take care of myself by eating good local food, by supporting fishers, hunters, foragers during the traditional Haida uh, food calendar. I follow Haida law, Yankudang, uh, to pay respect. And I have learned that everything belongs to everything else. I am proud to say that this is the education that is happening on Haida Gwaii right now when teaching about food and food systems. Hawa. Mm, thank you. I'm, I'm hearing these approaches grounded in, you know, indigenous ways of knowing and being, and, and it warms my heart knowing that this is the, this is the decolonizing work happening. Um, just gonna let let anyone else add to that if they'd like to before jumping to the next question. Sure. When I when I spend time in nature, I see the relationships between things. Right. The monoman, the wild rice, is a is fortified in relationships. It's a biosphere of water, plants, crawlers, swimmers, flyers, four leggeds, and two leggeds. They all help each other to have to create a rich life. 
the balance of these things um, this is all a balance of things. And when something is missing or changed, um, it affects everybody in the system. So if the water levels changed or chemicals or pollution are added, when the climate changes by man's actions in a short amount of time, it throws off this balance. Like our food comes from nature or the good food comes from nature. And when we understand the environment, we see how this affects our food systems. And we're bound to keep... and <laughs> and it's not, it prevents, it gives us more value for the food that we eat, right? Um, people sometimes get caught up in wanting like easier, cheaper, faster food, but uh, good food has a cost and we have to pay attention in the rest of our lives to ensure we can get the, we can produce the good food. Understanding uh, where our food comes from is one of the earlier steps to to helping ensure that we still have good food. So from the life, trying to understand the life cycle of our food is hard to find sometimes. Um, the products that we use in our life, it's hard to tell where they come from or, or what they've gone through. But when we look at this and we question it, and then we start to gain understanding, these are the, the actions that help us create better practices for the future. It's so true what you're saying, Damon, about, uh our responsibility, understanding where our food comes from is such a, what could be more basic than this nourishes us, right? We all, every human eats, and now there are almost 8 billion of us, and we all eat. So if, if we could all just connect to where our food comes from, it might put us, and, it, you know, if it was one little bit of what nourishes us day to day that people have grown themselves or, or foraged and harvested, it would just connect them, I think, in that appreciation of what nature has given us and not just sort of see it as, as the thing I bought from that convenience machine and I'm not going to throw away the wrapper afterwards. Um, the, this, and learning from nature, it's, it's so true. It, I've taken a few courses on permaculture and organic gardening, and one of the lessons is look to the forest as a teacher. I mean, you don't have to fertilize the forest. The for, we don't water the forest and it thrives and there's abundance there. And so the forest, the woods, they are the best teacher. And it's the best, I think, as a teacher, what I tell my students is that I, I hope they, I become uh, obsolete to them when they graduate. They, they don't need me. They, they've learned how to learn. And I think if we learn how to learn from nature, if we learn how to look and we learn how to listen and slow down, uh, that's, that's a really valuable and rich, rich lesson. Um, like, yeah, some of the students that I, I, I've taught, some of them are very, very bright. It's an enrichment program. And uh, when I first came into the program, I thought, oh, I don't know, like, shouldn't I be helping the kids who are really down and out and they, they, they're disadvantaged? Like, shouldn't I be? I felt a little uneasy about that privilege. And uh, I thought, well, okay, I've got this gig here's what we're going to do. We're going to learn about how privileged we are and the responsibility that comes with it. So we made social justice and social responsibility a huge, you know, hidden curriculum or umbrella curriculum to what we did. And that led us to food pretty early on um, and looking at issues of homelessness and hunger in the community. And um, we had an opportunity to really walk the talk by um, working and, and volunteering with um, a food bank garden. It's just a kilometer from our school. So for 10 years, we've been starting seedlings in our classroom. The, the other, the kids in the neighborhood call it the grow up because there's these lights that come out of the windows at night as everything's growing. And anyway, and they're all vegetables. And, um, and then we plant them in a greenhouse locally and it, the food goes to Meals on Wheels and our food bank and the senior center. But then tied in with that, at some point, there's an overlap in time where we, there's an, uh, an awakening of uh, right reconciliation in, in the education system, and a fabulous resource was reading um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book *Breeding Sweetgrass*, and her her lessons of the honorable harvest were many, but learning to care for that which cares for you, and seeing everything that comes from the land as a gift. Um, and I, I hope I'm taking more than my share here, Robbie, but. Uh, the gift, I mean, yes, there are lessons from the land, but helping students to have that, having, so I'll, I'll go back to her, her, one of her lessons, and that's, if, if you got a gift of, say, a hat from your grandmother, you would cherish it, you know, that her old hands knit it for you, and you would take care of that hat and treat it differently, 
if you saw, if, if you see your harvest, your squash or beans or whatever you've grown as a gift from the land, then maybe we'll learn to care for the land and love the land differently as well, not just see it as a yield, productivity numbers and so forth. Um, and I think it's that love and connection to the land that, that Damon, you're speaking of that just might be the thing that saves us. And we came upon this in our classroom the other day, like we've been, we had National Day for Reconciliation. It's very, very heavy. We learned about residential schools and, and we said, you know, wouldn't it be ironic if the people who were so poorly treated by Canada, if that little nugget and gem of culture that we learn to love nature and learn to live sustainably is the thing that saves everyone, wouldn't that be something? And they kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> in a guilty way, isn't that just the gift that just might save everyone? who's behaved so poorly. Mm. The gift that keeps on giving. Mm. The land itself, that, gosh, you, we've touched on so many things already. I'd just like to point out, yeah, what you'd said about the positionality and, and, and finding our relationship with the land from whom we are and where we are at in our learning journey. And whether that means as indigenous peoples reclaiming our sovereignty, or if that's folks holding privilege and acknowledging that and reclaiming a relationship that's built on respect, reciprocity, and learning, that, that theme, that reciprocity and learning um, that transcends food systems. I mean, we're talking about a, a whole transformation of the self and students um, seeing it in action. Would anyone else like to uh, jump onto this one before we move to the next question? I'm, I, I would love to just sit here and go on tangents with, with y'all for days here. Um, I'm just going to throw it into the, in the chat here just so we have it on hand. And yeah, so we did talk a little bit about where your approach or practice is based, whether it's, you know, within a specific world of you um, or the, the place in which you're teaching from. Yeah. And I'd offer, yes, yeah, Cyan or, or Damon to start us off with this. And what does your practice or approach uh, look like when it comes to land-based teaching yeah sure um, um i have the privilege to work in a public school on a private reserve in skittigate british columbia um, my school is named skaganai elementary school skaganai means learning house in Haidakil. that's the skittigate dialect of the Haida language our school is surrounded by our learning forest with um, an eagle's nest on the grounds, beach access down the road, an amazing greenhouse on the site, and it's dedicated to a precious child who lost her battle to cancer at a young age. Um, we have a natural play space with designed um, wood space that is local wood. Um, our play space is also surrounded by salmonberry bushes, fireweed patches, salel, huckleberry and thimbleberry bushes, fruit trees and shade trees, and of course the traditional climbers, swings, basketball courts, and covered outdoor spaces. I speak of these spaces as they have become the grit of my best practice. Having these spaces supports the well-being of the precious children. Um, these reciprocal relationships focus on connectedness and a sense of place. Land-based learning is understanding that humans, creatures, plants, trees, and non-living entities are all interconnected. Our diverse school community makes it possible for me to share my voice in this collective and complex learning environment. My land-based land le learning um, practice looks like learning with the mind, body, and spirit. The relationships with others and the environment is reciprocal and responsive. We are very lucky to play on this land as it is an integral to the well-being and learning of our children. And that interconnectedness, absolutely. Go ahead, Damon. Um, for me, land-based learning is like about a more sensory thing, right? For us, um, all your senses are heightened when you're out in nature. So it's not like how many pixels you can see on your screen. Um, it's not about the filters that we use, right? It's it's like when I do wild rice, the smells are a major part of how I read the wild rice, like its readiness at each stage in the production, the way that it sounds as it falls into the boat and things like I can talk about, but aren't really conveyed unless you're experiencing them, right? Um, when you're out in nature, if you go camping or you've spent time in a lodge, 
hearing, your hearing is heightened, right? A little animal can sound like such a big thing instead of us in our regular day-to-day -day lives where we're blocking out so much of the white noise or things that we're being bombarded with because they're not a part of our actual in the moment process. Um, Learn land-based learning is a fuller experience, right? In the Ojibwe language, we uh, talk about the petroglyphs as the Kinomogao Sinan, which are the teaching rocks. Like they're the things that are the teachers. So for me, I'm constantly learning more as I work with the wild rice. Every year or different stages in my life, it's teaching me things. So when I was young, I wanted to, to learn how to work hard. I felt like I was a bit of a lazy teenager and uh. I believe that was true. <laughs> so I wanted to learn how to work hard. And then later I ended up in a wandering stage of life, right? And so it gave me purpose. The wild rice gave me purpose and direction. And now as mother and a uh, mother of two and soon to be three, it, it gives me direction as looking to the future. So it's always teaching me and my experience with it is, is so full, right? Um, it's not in the wild rice itself. My experience of the wild rice and its place in nature changes too. Like the good years that we have or the, the years that it's not doing so well. I'm still learning about the physical rice. But um, now I, I use what I've learned from the rice and I, you help, I try and help facilitate the rice's teaching. So the Minoman teaches people about identity, right? Um, I try and bridge a gap, a gap, a massive gap um, between our rich history and all the things that we have or had, and then this ugly past. And how do we get, how do we get through that? And the Minoman helps me take people through that for um, to find healing in themselves and to find healing with what's been done to us, finding the rich food that we had and great ways of providing for our families and how that was disrupted and how we can have that again and how we can share that with the people that's important to us and the people maybe that don't even deserve it <laughs> at times right um so like for me on a day-to-day -day, my dad will give a teaching when I do I do tours of wild rice. I take people out in the canoe. My dad will start with a day of uh, the teaching about how Minoman came into his life and about a history for us of how wild rice came to us and a bit about it as a bigger to our people. Um, everybody sits in a circle on a log and it's a humbling experience and he goes through that and it's a great place to start. And then I take them out in canoes and I teach them how to gather traditionally using two cedar sticks in a canoe. And it's a slow process. And there's a lot that can be taken from it, but it's, it's one day. So you're getting a tiny bit of information out of the, <laughs> what's available to us from the actual practice, right? And then we come back to shore and I teach them how to work the wild rice or work with the wild rice to end up with food at the end of the day. So that includes like roasting it over a fire, putting the fire out, then we dance on the wild rice and then we winnow the rice. So um, throwing it in the air and letting the wind take out all the chaff that we've danced off and we end up with food at the end. But you grow, you, you grow value for your food like that too, right? But it's really about like connecting people to their identity and helping them learn who they are and what has happened through this practice, but you're ended up with something nutritious at the end of the day. <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> that's poetic. I, I, if, I, if I could just pull in some strands together, although it, it weaves itself as going back to what Cyan said, the interconnected nature of it all, and um, you know, whether it be the medicines or ourselves, the sensory, learning from the sensory, the getting outside of our, our classroom, our bubble, and onto the land and learning from it, um, and, and it providing ongoing learning, um, as, as, as Damon had said, um, and continually uh, providing direction. Um, yeah, so powerful. Alan, did you, uh, I'm sure you have something amazing to say as well. <laughs> Maybe not as poetic as Damon, but yes. Uh, well, 
spaces, I mean, Cyan, you're talking about spaces as well and how important they are. And it's, I, it's so important, I think, for school to um, feel like feel like it reflects you, it reflects your culture, no matter who you are. Um, and so for Indigenous children, is that is that present in the school system? And often it's, it hasn't been the case. Um, at our school at Lowboro, we've created, um, with community members who are of the Anishinaabe community, a rock circle that we refer to as a sacred circle. And um, there are rocks in the north, south, east, and west that are painted with the appropriate color um, of the four directions. And then the center of the circle are um, um, flagstones are uh, engraved the seven grandfather teachings in English and in Anish uh, Um And we had just this week, last week, um, a grass dancer come and, and demonstrate and give, give some teachings about um, the traditions. And part of that, the grass dancer's job, I, we were told was to open up a new space, make sure it was safe. And that was woven into kind of reveal to the students that we're getting a new greenhouse and teaching kitchen. And um, that's really exciting for us. And that came about because I guess I'm going to blame the farm to school people and the salad all started with a bowl of salad. <laughs> but now we want to make our own kitchen and our own, our own teaching, um, our, our own greenhouse. And, and we've gotten funding from, from folks to do that. The so, so it's, it is important for school to reflect. And even in the, if I can go back to that social justice piece and, and sense of responsibility, some of the lessons that we teach students can be pretty heavy. And young people are already dealing with a great deal of anxiety. It's, if you went back about 15 years, I didn't hear the word anxiety very much. And it's come about a lot more. We see this diagnosis again and again. And when teaching, let's say climate change, it, why wouldn't one feel anxious about it? And by definition, it's feeling hopeless and not having anything that one can do to make change. And so I kind of made a promise to my students, I won't teach you anything that you can't do something about to make it better. We can't change history, but we can make tomorrow better. We, we didn't create climate change and it's upsetting, but here's some things that we can do about it. And by knowing where you your food comes from and learning to grow your own food, or supporting the local food movement, that's almost as important as what kind of car you're driving or how you got to school, you're on your bike or the Diona Humvee. It, it, it's a really powerful tool and that is empowering. And I think it's our responsibility to empower kids to make that change. Um, so the salad or the, um, the greenhouse that we're getting in the teaching kitchen actually came from a student project. We, we gave them a project, it was sort of like Dragon's Den where they pitched an idea and, um, they, they wanted to leave their school in, in better shape than they found it. And um, we've brainstormed and I worked a lot with them, but we decided that this, this space would affect three things. Reconciliation in the sense that we could grow varieties, um, save seed that are indigenous to the area and save those with other communities. Um, we got to start with that. We, we, in our food bank garden, we grew a kind of corn called black sweet. Um, that we got from Tandanega were gifted and uh, it grew beautifully this year. Um, and also it'll address food security issues and, and food literacy and just learning how to, how to cook for oneself can, that can actually give you more access to education opportunities because it's cheaper than a, a meal plan. And then of course, climate change. I mean, if we, if we all learn how to garden, we all learn how to cook good food and less packaged food, we'll probably waste less and we'll, we'll care for the planet. So that's that's part of my approach i i suppose helping school be meaningful empowering and to reflect the many the diverse cultures that are in the room with us and delicious and it tastes great healing on so many levels you know i mean not physically mentally emotionally spiritually it's beautiful but you're right. When you get to eat something, you, you sat in class and you get to, you get, or you're out walking in the woods and you get to eat as a result is fabulous. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's, that, that, uh, that student sovereignty and power to make decisions and, and to do good and wanting to do good. Mm -hmm. Having ownership mm -hmm. over the direction of what you're learning improves engagement so many times. You own it. Absolutely. Organic makes sense. It's, it's beautiful. Um, 
I'd love to pose, go, uh, go ahead, Damon. I'm just gonna pose our next question in the chat and then I'll ask it next, please. Sure, I was just gonna say, yeah, the earlier you can, can, can connect kids or people to their food, the earlier they can start caring. And when they start caring young, it, it carries with them through their life, right? And it, it's an advantage for them. And I think that like, for me, it seemed like it was a privileged thing before, like I seen it <laughs> as something of people of privilege got um cared about their food in the farm to table movement earlier. And now that it's spreading into like the population and, and it's from connecting children and everybody can care about where the food comes from. Mm -hmm. Relearning the teachings, like you said too, and you're able to offer and, and taking it outside of the classroom and what's just considered curriculum. You said your father sharing those, those stories. I mean, more powerful than any lecture I've been to. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been really blessed with like uh, being raised like that. And I'm, I feel like I have an advantage, right? From just being raised with those teachings and even if i abandoned them for like times in my life i had something to come back to when i was looking for it mm -hmm. hopefully it's one of the, the if there's any benefit to this covid situation where we were all at home and making sourdough bread we connected to food and so you couldn't buy a packet of seeds in may of 2020 everybody was starting a new garden in their backyard and connecting so we've just got to get everyone to hold on to that eh? mm -hmm. I think I feel like there was a lot of support from the parent community at, at, just in the last almost two years because everyone did seem to be like, oh yeah right food oh we could have bare shelves oh right we do uh we'd have to so think many layers to the learning yeah. in food yeah yeah Cyan did you Sir, I'd like to add a little bit. Um, my yeah. archipelago that I do live on is the communities around us um, are very uh, dependent on the ferry system, um, which often in our case is weather dependent to have it e even arrive. And sometimes when it is arriving, it's not arriving in its best condition. So it's very important for us to um, have these teachings and these food securities already in place for our children and for the new generation. Um, as uh, sometimes we are going without and uh, it's important that um, we, we are able to have this food security chain happening on Haida Gwaii. On so many levels, our food systems need to change and you know, it starts on the ground and, and with the work that you are all doing truly. Um, I had one more question that I would love to pose to everyone, whomever feels ready to answer it, and is, do you had any advice for non-Indigenous teachers for how to bring land-based education approach in a respectful and appropriate way? I, I think sometimes teachers feel like they have to be know-it-alls, and you don't. It's, if you're non-Indigenous, you don't, and you need to ask people who do know and invite them in, and, and that's and all those initiatives that you were mentioning at the beginning, Robbie, that I had, there's not one of them that there wasn't a community partner or someone who was advising that. And so often I just turn the mic over to my guests and, and I'll ask questions and model, uh, try to model learning for the students. There are things I don't know and, and let's learn this together. So humility. <laughs> Humility and partnership, absolutely. Yeah. Learning from the Indigenous leaders and, and community members, yeah. Damon? Yeah, I think uh, any anybody like can reach out into nature or get something from the environment um, that if you're seeking Indigenous people's advice that it's important to use tobacco or sama as we call it um, and asking with that as an offering. So I'll share a quick version of the story of Sama, which is that once upon a time, everything had the ability to speak between itself. So between each other, um, the plants and the animals could talk with each other, the bodies of water could speak, the rocks could speak. Um, and somewhere along the way, especially people have lo I've lost the ability to speak two things and so sama is the one plant that remembers how to speak between everything and that is why indigenous people use it when they're offering it um it's to 
to speak your intentions and your wills so that there's not a miscommunication and that is one of them like it's a practice you should always <laughs> you should always use and do and when trying to seek out indigenous knowledge um yeah so our so our intention we heard through all of creation also the knowledge holders and keepers are are hard to seek out at times and there can be trust issues um don't come looking for answers in a day. There's not a handout with all the answers on it. <laughs> it's gaining meaning from little bits at a time, right? So going out and each time you're looking for those, those little diamonds or those little tidbits or those little bits and you gather that as part of your learning process. Uh, uh, but yeah, you can't expect all the answers to come in a day because you've seeked indigenous <laughs> input, right? Absolutely. Learning from the land. Yeah, again, and the answers being found there. If we if we slow down and we take the time to listen, remember our, our responsibilities. Yeah. Cyan? Sure. Um, as having no Indigenous DNA, um, my answer is very personal, of course, experience. Um, my best practice is created in which all abilities, culture, language, and traditions and uh, heritage are celebrated and woven together. Um, we have an important role to to contribute to reconciliation, to meaningfully participate and contribute to a land-based approach is to be part of the transformative, transformative change. Uh, finding a personal pathway, of course, will connect you to the land, seek out your Indigenous knowledge keepers, invite the families to contribute, find support in your school districts, and utilize the strong webs of community relationships that have been caring for the precious children since millennia. Oh my goodness, so much there once again. Oh, thank you. Like the inclusivity of it, bringing everyone in regardless, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, human beings back into, into relationship. Um, I'd like to pose this next question to the whole group. If um, someone's looking to get started in bringing land-based learning approach into their educational practice, uh, where should they start? You know, it's maybe some practical approach, um, first steps for, for folks looking to get involved. Sure, I can start with that one. Um, yeah. For me, I would suggest uh, connecting with your community where, where you live in, of course. Uh, my personal connection was made possible as I was welcomed in the community during my healing. Um, I made time to experience cultural opportunities that connected me to the knowledge keepers, to the elders, and to the precious children. I made time to join in on any professional development that was created by Indigenous educators. And uh, I joined meetings, mourned with the community, collaborated with colleagues, listened to many leaders, and celebrated in many historical events like pole raisings and potlatches. I've learned to speak some Haida language uh, and some words so I can speak to the elders and the precious children of Haida Gwaii. I also take pride in the ability to include every child's way of being and doing. Most of our work of the work on bringing land-based learning approach to our classrooms has been done already. Um, started with the wonderful elders at the Skidigit Haida Immersion Program, which is SHIP. Uh, Skidigit and Old Masset Band Councils are Indigenous principal, Haida language educators, Indigenous resource workers, language nest educators, and our school-based team of educators and principals, past and present. And by strengthening the connection to the land-based learning approach, the vision of inclusive spaces and practices include children with diverse abilities. Um, I come with an open mind and the idea that I'm striving to contribute uh, to lasting reconciliation with my Indigenous families and friends as we implement the United Nations Declarations of Rights of Indigenous People and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. Thank you, Sam. Well, your contributions certainly matter. Hawa. Um, I, yeah. would, I would echo what, what you were saying in that starting locally is really important. Starting with one's own community is, is really important. Um, there's just, there's so many, if you're connecting your land-based education to you know, the indigenous community locally, um, just recognizing that there's such diversity across Turtle Island when you talk about Indigenous peoples, you're talking about so many different languages, traditions, stories, cultures. 
Um, and so being careful and, and asking questions, definitely don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to make, state, make mistakes because that's what real learning looks like. You will make mistakes. You'll have fantastic failures and good for you. Uh, forgive yourself and ask for forgiveness and move on and keep learning. Um, we grew tobacco, uh, Sema, in our, our food bank garden the last few years. And when an elder would come and work with the, the, our students, um, it was a great gift. We would do, we would make a red bundle and we would give it with our left hand because that was closest to our hearts. And we would give it in, in that way. And if they accepted it, it was great. And they would talk about it and talk about its significance. And um, that's not every indigenous group's tradition and, and, and to do it in that fashion, but it is it's the local one. So it took a while to learn that. Um, for instance, but yeah, just being, being a student of the area, I think is important. Try whatever you do. Don't let your fear, uh, inhibit you from trying in the first place. I'd like to say, uh, me gratitude to you, Alan, for, uh, doing that with your students. Um, mm -hmm. one time I thought it would be great for me and my dad to teach people how to do tobacco ties as part of their learning experience. And they showed yeah. up with tobacco plants that were already growing. So they had already started down that journey and it was pretty funny. Nice. To see. Right on. Um, it, is, it is interesting when the last time the kids have talked about tobacco, it's some uh, health department teens trashing tobacco. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, this is different. This is different. And let's, and talk about the history, like, Oh, this isn't another appropriation. How did tobacco become so poisonous? Um, it's another form of colonization, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they like something that's supposed to be the first plant on earth to us and like destroyed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And made it something evil, right? Or like, and my dad always says, you don't have to smoke the tobacco. It's there to put down on the ground and offer as like, to put as an offering. And that one question led to when the elder came and she um she taught us that as you harvest there's a song that you sing and there's a lesson from the song and here are some language pieces and just layer upon layer because we asked the question and tried and yeah then, and right from our creation story right like mm -hmm. it was way back yeah yeah the responsibilities found within those simple gestures and words i mean are so profound and deep once they're recognized and mm -hmm. the tobacco. I'm, sh I'm going to be sharing some tobacco this evening in a few hours with some um, non-Indigenous students. And I'm, I can, I'm sweaty after speaking about it. It was meant to be. <laughs> and the significance of the smudge as well, people coming in and, and distinguishing it from a religious ceremony and explaining this is, it's different. It's not, this isn't a religion that we're bringing in. It's, it's framing it in an appropriate way. Um, Absolutely. We else would want to speak to that in a better way than I could, but. I'd like to, before that, let's just, yeah, it's, yeah. it's already been said by everyone, but the acknowledging of the diversity, welcoming of in, the inclusivity, but respecting that, that, that knowledge and where it's coming from and using it appropriately, learning along the way. It's okay to make mistakes, but under, coming in with that, modicum and understanding of, of respect yeah nicely said robbie yeah. and if um anyone would like to continue on with that with that last question about their approach or really anything you'd like to to leave us with here that this 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 evening um i think that anybody can start a land-based teaching or whatever and it's just by going outside and following your des desire and your curiosity to learn right um the more time you spend outside the 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 more you learn and so i think of it like each day is a dot to dot on a dot to dot picture and you end up with a better a more beautiful picture the more time you spend outside so like I'm a regular person. I spend lots of time inside. I like air conditioning at times, especially while I'm pregnant. Um, but in the fall, when I get out there to do wild rice on a regular basis, I feel like, like I have way more life going on. And when I'm out there for sugar bush in the springtime, um, my life feels fuller and I feel like I've gotten more from it just from going outside. So it's not always about what each individual lesson is, but just, just spending the time and, and learning that there's more to life than a book, right? Sorry, guys. <laughs> Keep it simple. I love it. 
Mm, so true. That's so beautiful, Damon. Thank you. And so I think you're connecting to the mental health piece too, eh? Just like something about being outside, fresh air and the sun hits your skin. And I think there's microbes that really help us feel happy too when we get our hands dirty. There's research to demonstrate that as well. Yeah, and the sunlight and a same with the COVID, like the people that are spending time outside are doing better, right? It's a, it's a safer space for us. Um, yeah, just go outside. <laughs> Yeah. And like, okay, so it's the working. So for us, wild rice is super nutritious, right? It has a lot of nutritional value, but I tell people it's the process that we, that we go through with the wild rice that gives you that really good health. Mm -hmm. So it, the, each stage works a different part of your body. And at the end, you end up with great food to eat. So true, right? So you're at Outside, you're exercising better, you're exercising period, and then your nutrition is better because of the harvest, and then you sleep better because you're, you've got that honest tiredness at the end of the day. You're too tired to stay up and watch Netflix. And so there's all these pieces of what brings happiness to you, right? And making your body healthy. Mm -hmm. A beautiful circle. It is. Is the, the, all, the concept of all my relations is one that... Cutting it off. Which, yeah, all, folks have been talking about recently with me, and um, there's a wonderful project going on nearby where uh, there's a tiny forest being uh, planted. On um, it's it's land that's being used and transformed by the Kingston uh, Indigenous Learning Network, and uh, so they're planting about 900 trees. We are planting, like volunteers are coming in, and they talk about them holding hands under the soil with their roots. They're very very close together, and there was a protocol as we planted them we, we added some mycelium like spores from a healthy forest and, and soil from a healthy forest to, to trans knit that um and they said this is how they're going to all my, don't see it as planting a tree but if you're planting a relative uh, it's just a, a beautiful concept again yeah. and then going back back to that idea of gratitude and being it's, at home i mean when do you feel more at home than when you're around your relatives and surrounded by it's so true. Like there's been times in my life where I felt like alone in things. And my dad, my dad instilled the thought that each one of those grains of rice out there are one of my ancestors. And so when I look out at the wild rice bed, I see like thousands of my, you know, so many ancestors all there and they just want to spend time with you and be a uh, participate in your life mm. and, feed you and, you know, just be with you. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. You're not alone. You're never alone. Mm -hmm. But I like to, all this mycelium. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I'd like to share something. Um, uh, Chief Skidigat Lewis Collinson had written in March of 1968. Um, he writes, people are like trees and groups of people are like forests. People are like trees and groups of people are like forests. While the forests are composed of many different kinds of trees, these trees intertwine their roots so strongly that it is imp impossible for the strongest winds which which blow on our islands to uproot the forest. For each tree strengthens its neighbor and their roots are inter, inter, intricately intertwined in the same way that people of our islands composed of members of nations and races from all over the world are beginning to intertwine their roots to strong, so strongly that no troubles will affect them. Just as one tree standing alone would soon be destroyed by the first strong wind which comes along, so it is impossible or any person, any family or any community member to stand alone against the troubles of this world. Mm -hmm. Nice. How, uh... That reminds me of some of the, 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 reminds me of some of the things that Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about in, in forests and yeah, how the trees hold each other up. Just like people do when a strong wind blows, it's the trees that are growing tightly in together that share their strength and yeah, the mice and, and and so she's the the idea of the braiding in the braiding sweetgrass is that she was raised with indigenous knowledge from her mother, but she also was trained as a biologist and sort of the Western traditional, and she's woven those two within her. She she sees when she sees a forest, she sees all my relations, and she sees photosynthesis and you know root exudates and how my psyllium are taking those so it's a wonderful it, it's a fun one it's a beautiful phenomenon really within this one human and maybe our, our steps forward we live in this we are all kind of treaty people and metis people in a way this land is a mix of people from all over the world 
and it'll be through these relationships that we move forward stronger together. So again, a lesson from the forest. Mm -hmm. Doesn't our future look really bright? <laughs> we'll talk to you guys, it does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that my, I'm sitting with that my the analogy of the mycelium, the symbolism there of of what is what is being said, even with the, the two-eyed seeing approach. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so grateful to have been in, in conversation with with all of you, Damon, Cyan, and Alan. Thank you, Miigwech, Hawa. I'd like to just offer each of you a little space to to say any final thoughts before we before we finalize our, our conversation here today. I feel my plate is full. I am nourished. I'm excited and I'm very grateful. I'm also honored to be here and hear all of us speak and honor our voices. Hawa. We could learn one word. We'll say Hawa. That means thank you. Hawa. Hawa. Hawa Sayan. Yeah, just thank you for including me in this and letting me be a part of it. And I hope that uh, a lot of learning comes from this. Miigwech. I've certainly learned a lot from you, Damon Miigwech. Thank you so much for being here. And best of luck with your new adventures and the little one on the way. Shi mm -hmm. to to both of you, to all of you. And um, I'm really appreciative of the relationship with Farm to School Canada. They, I got a grant way back in 2016, and uh, I'm really, really appreciative of the relationship that has um, has been maintained with Carolyn and Jesse, and and I maybe I'll get to, to meet you too, Christina. And it's lovely learning from you, Damon and and John and and Robbie. So best of luck, everyone. Mm -hmm. I feel that's very um, important too to acknowledge our farm to school and farm to cafeteria, food to school, local food to school all the beautiful programs that have been supporting us in our school districts. Hawa. You took the words right out of my mouth, Cyan. Yeah, thank you so much for Farm to Cafeteria Canada. This is such an amazing initiative and I'll certainly be advocating it for it from, from this day forward. Uh, thank you again, Alan, Cyan and Damon. Uh, everyone take care and, and be well. I'll leave some words from, from the territory that I'm on, uh, uh, not Samat, which is uh, we are all one. I believe there's a lot of similarities there with uh, all my relations.